a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. J.P. Morgan John Pierpont Morgan Sr. was an American financier and banker who dominated corporate finance and industrial consolidation in the United States of America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In 1892 Morgan arranged the merger of Edison General Electric and Thomson Houston Electric Company to form General Electric. He also played important roles in the formation of the United States Steel Corporation, International Harvester and AT&T. At the height of Morgan's career during the early 20th century, he and his partners had financial investments in many large corporations and had significant influence over the nation's high finance and United States Congress members. He directed the banking coalition that stopped the Panic of 1907. He was the leading financier of the Progressive Era, and his dedication to efficiency and modernization helped transform American business. Adrian Wooldridge characterized Morgan as America's greatest banker. Morgan died in Rome. Italy, in his sleep in 1913 at the age of 75, leaving his fortune and business to his son, John Pierpont Morgan Jr. Biographer Ron Chernow estimated his fortune at only $80 million, prompting John D. Rockefeller to say, and to think, he wasn't even a rich man. Childhood and Education Morgan was born into the influential Morgan family in Hartford, Connecticut, and was raised there. He was the son of Eunuch Spencer Morgan and Juliet Pierpont. Pierpont, as he preferred to be known, had a varied education due in part to the plans of his father. In the fall of 1848, Pierpont transferred to the Hartford Public School and then to the Episcopal Academy in Cheshire, Connecticut, boarding with the principal. In September 1851, Morgan passed the entrance exam for the English High School of Boston, a school specializing in mathematics to prepare young men for careers in commerce. In the spring of 1852, an illness struck which was to become more common as his life progressed. Rheumatic fever left him in so much pain that he could not walk, and Eunuch sent him to the Azores to recover. He convalesced there for almost a year, then returned to the English high school in Boston to resume his studies. After he graduated, his father sent him to Belle Reve a school in the Swiss village of La Tour de Pales, where he gained fluency in French. His father then sent him to the University of Göttingen in order to improve his German. He attained a passable level of German within six months, and also a degree in art history, then travelled back to London via Wiesbaden, with his formal education complete. Early Years and Life Morgan went into banking in 1857 at the London branch of merchant banking firm Peabody. Morgan and Company a partnership between his father and George Peabody founded three years earlier. In 1858, he moved to New York City to join the banking house of Duncan, Sherman, and Company, the American representatives of George Peabody and Company. During the American Civil War, in an incident known as the Hall Carbine Affair, Morgan financed the purchase of 5,000 rifles from an army arsenal at $3.50 each, which were then resold to a field general for $22 each. Morgan had avoided serving during the war by paying a substitute $300 to take his place. From 1860 to 1864, as J. Pierpont Morgan and Company, he acted as agent in New York for his father's firm, renamed J.S. Morgan and Company upon Peabody's retirement in 1864. From 1864-72, he was a member of the firm of Dabney, Morgan, and Company. In 1871, he partnered with the Drexels of Philadelphia to form the New York firm of Drexel, Morgan, and Company. At that time, Anthony J. Drexel became Pierpont's mentor at the request of Eunuch Morgan. J.P. Morgan and Company After the death of Anthony Drexel, the firm was rechristened J. P. Morgan and Company, in 1895, retaining close ties with Drexel and Company of Philadelphia, Morgan, Hodges and Company of Paris, and J. S. Morgan and Company of London. By 1900, it was one of the most powerful banking houses of the world, focused especially on reorganizations and consolidations. Morgan had many partners over the years, such as George W. Perkins, but always remained firmly in charge. His process of taking over troubled businesses to reorganize them became known as Morganization. 
Morgan reorganized business structures and management in order to return them to profitability. His reputation as a banker and financier also helped bring interest from investors to the businesses that he took over. Treasury Gold The Federal Treasury was nearly out of gold in 1895, at the depths of the Panic of 1893. Morgan had put forward a plan for the federal government to buy gold from his and European banks, but it was declined in favor of a plan to sell bonds directly to the general public to overcome the crisis. Morgan, sure there was not enough time to implement such a plan, demanded and eventually obtained a meeting with Grover Cleveland, where he claimed the government could default the day if they didn't do something. Morgan came up with a plan to use an old Civil War statute that allowed Morgan and the Rothschilds to sell gold directly to the U.S. Treasury, 3.5 million ounces, to restore the Treasury surplus, in exchange for a 30-year bond issue. The episode saved the Treasury, but hurt Cleveland's standing with the agrarian wing of the Democratic Party, and became an issue in the election of 1896 when banks came under a withering attack from William Jennings Bryan. Morgan and Wall Street bankers donated heavily to Republican William McKinley, who was elected in 1896, and re-elected in 1900. Steel After the death of his father in 1890, Morgan took control of J.S. Morgan and Company. Morgan began talks with Charles M. Schwab, president of Carnegie Company and businessman Andrew Carnegie in 1900. The goal was to buy out Carnegie's steel business and merge it with several other steel, coal, mining and shipping firms. After financing the creation of the Federal Steel Company, he finally merged it in 1901 with the Carnegie Steel Company and several other steel and iron businesses to form the United States Steel Corporation. In 1901 U.S. Steel was the first billion-dollar company in the world having an authorized capitalization of $1.4 billion, which was much larger than any other industrial firm and comparable in size to the largest railroads. U.S. Steel aimed to achieve greater economies of scale, reduce transportation and resource costs, expand product lines, and improve distribution. It was also planned to allow the United States to compete globally with the United Kingdom and Germany. Schwab and others claim that U.S. steel's size would allow the company to be more aggressive and effective in pursuing distant international markets. U.S. steel was regarded as a monopoly by critics, as the business was attempting to dominate not only steel, but also the construction of bridges, ships, railroad cars and rails, wire, nails, and a host of other products. With U.S. steel, Morgan had captured two-thirds of the steel market and Schwab was confident that the company would soon hold a 75% market share. However, after 1901 the business market share dropped. Schwab resigned from U.S. Steel in 1903 to form Bethlehem Steel, which became the second largest U.S. steel producer. Labor policy was a contentious issue. U.S. Steel was non-union, and experienced steel producers, led by Schwab, wanted to keep it that way, with the use of aggressive tactics to identify and root out pro-union, troublemakers. The lawyers, and bankers who had organized the merger, notably Morgan and CEO Albert Gary, were more concerned with long-range profits, stability, good public relations, and avoiding trouble. The bankers' views generally prevailed, and the result was a paternalistic labor policy. Panic of 1907 the Panic of 1907 was a financial crisis that almost crippled the American economy. Major New York banks were on the verge of bankruptcy, and there was no mechanism to rescue them, until Morgan stepped in to help resolve the crisis. Treasury Secretary George B. Cortelyou earmarked $35 million of federal money to deposit in New York banks. Morgan then met with the nation's leading financiers in his New York mansion, where he forced them to devise a plan to meet the crisis. James Stillman, president of the National City Bank, also played a central role. Morgan organized a team of bank and trust executives which redirected money between banks, secured further international lines of credit, and bought up the plummeting stocks of healthy corporations. A delicate political issue arose regarding the brokerage firm of Moore & Schley, which was deeply involved in a speculative pull in the stock of the Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad Company. Moore and Schley had pledged over $6 million of the Tennessee coal and iron stock for loans among the Wall Street banks. 
The banks had called the loans, and the firm could not pay. If more and Schley should fail, a hundred more failures would follow and then all Wall Street might go to pieces. Morgan decided they had to save more and Schley. TCI was one of the chief competitors of U.S. Steel and it owned valuable iron and coal deposits. Morgan controlled U.S. Steel and he decided it had to buy the TCI stock from Moore and Schley. Elbert Gary, head of U.S. Steel, agreed, but was concerned there would be antitrust implications that could cause grave trouble for U.S. Steel, which was already dominant in the steel industry. Morgan sent Gary to see President Theodore Roosevelt, who promised legal immunity for the deal. U.S. Steel thereupon paid $30 million for the TCI stock and Moore and Schley were saved. The announcement had an immediate effect. By November 7, 1907, the panic was over. The crisis underscored the need for a powerful oversight mechanism, vowing to never let it happen again, and realizing that in a future crisis there was unlikely to be another Morgan. In 1913 banking and political leaders, led by Senator Nelson Aldrich, devised a plan that resulted in the creation of the Federal Reserve System in 1913. Banking's Critics While conservatives in the progressive era hailed Morgan for his civic responsibility, his strengthening of the national economy, and his devotion to the arts and religion, the left wing viewed him as one of the central figures in the system it rejected. Morgan redefined conservatism in terms of financial prowess coupled with strong commitments to religion and high culture. Enemies of banking attacked Morgan for the terms of his loan of gold to the federal government in the 1895 crisis and, together with Ryder Upton Sinclair, they attacked him for the financial resolution of the Panic of 1907. They also attempted to attribute to him the financial ills of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. In December 1912, Morgan testified before the Poe Committee, a subcommittee of the House Banking and Currency Committee. The committee ultimately concluded that a small number of financial leaders was exercising considerable control over many industries. The partners of J.P. Morgan and Company and directors of First National and National City Bank controlled aggregate resources of $22.245 billion, which Louis Brandeis, later a U.S. Supreme Court justice, compared to the value of all the property in the 22 states west of the Mississippi River. Nikola Tesla In 1900, the inventor Nikola Tesla convinced Morgan he could build a transatlantic wireless communication system that would outperform the short-range radio wave-based wireless telegraph system then being demonstrated by Guglielmo Marconi. Morgan agreed to give Tesla $150,000 to build the system in return for a 51% control of the patents. Almost as soon as the contract was signed Tesla decided to scale up the facility to include his ideas of terrestrial wireless power transmission to make what he thought was a more competitive system. Morgan considered Tesla's changes and requests for the additional amounts of money to build it a breach of contract and refused to fund the changes. With no additional investment capital available the project at Warden Cliff was abandoned in 1906, never to become operational. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries Would you like to know more?